Please note, this podcast series features graphic descriptions of forensic pathology techniques, violent crimes, accidents and traumatic incidents that some listeners may find distressing or upsetting. More and more people in the West are turning to herbal therapies for relief from disease or for general well-being. But as Professor Bayard explains, even herbal remedies can kill. He details several cases from Australia and around the world where people have died by consuming preparations they thought were natural but were anything but. And also makes the case for stronger regulation of what's become a multi-billion dollar industry. From the advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide, this is Guardians of the Dead, a podcast exploring the ground where death and science meet. I'm Greg Barilla. G'day, I'm Elisa Black and I'm here today with Roger Bayard, Professor of Forensic Pathology at the University of Adelaide, and we're going to talk about herbal medicines. Tell me about the bloke who injected essence of toad. It was actually a Chinese herbal tea that he bought thinking it was amphetamine, and uh, his mate injected some and was quite ill, so he then injected more and died. Now, the problem with herbal products is that looking for different types of herbs or organic preparations, like a needle in a haystack, because there's just so many and they're so complicated. But one of the toxicologists at uh, Forensic Science uh, worked very hard on this case, and he found bufotenine. Now, that's a uh, toxic substance found in toad skin that is sometimes put into herbal preparations. It must be okay to drink it, but not to inject it. Is that because when you drink something like that, it might have an effect on your body, so then you would, in your mind, think this tea is actually doing the thing it was promised to do, even though it's probably not doing anything at all like you'd hope it would do? Well, I think the thing about herbal medicines we've got to remember is that they've been used for thousands of years in, in thousands of communities. And, you know, I think there's no doubt that they can actually help in the treatment of disease. The difficulty now is that it's not the village herbalist who's been treating your family for 30 years and has had no deaths or illnesses and has helped people. This is a multi-billion dollar multinational industry. And of course, when you've got lots of money involved, then standards are not necessarily followed. And it's not a regulated industry. Organization estimates 80% of the world's population uses some type of herbal medicine. Around 60% of Australians take herbal medications. It's a growing trend in treating a variety of issues like fatigue. Medical experts say consumers are being conned by misleading labels and face serious health risks and even death. So I think that's probably um, one of the, the major issues with this. And that's a big problem, right? People... You know, we live in such a polarised time when people are talking about whether vaccines are good or bad. People want to think that big pharma is all about profits, but at least there's regulations involved when we're talking about pharmaceutical products. There's no regulations at all when it's coming to herbal preparations. There are regulations, but it's not nearly as stringent as it is for... You're right, too, about people being polarised. Um, I published a review of herbal medicines and issues that occur in a an American forensic journal, I didn't think it would get any notice, and I got attacked on social media. You know, people saying, you and your drug companies are killing tens of thousands of people a year. Well, drugs do kill a lot of people. But it's almost like saying, well, you know, you can be murdered by being stabbed, but being shot's okay. You know, everything has risks. And I think people think with herbal preparations, they're natural, therefore they're safe. Ebola fever is natural. You know, volcanoes are natural, they're not safe. So I don't understand why people can't get it that if something has a therapeutic effect, logically it could have a therapeutic side effect. And that's all we're saying with our investigations and our research here is that let's make it as safe for the community as possible. People have a right to know what they're taking and what the effects might be. So are you seeing more bodies come through your doors because of things like 
herbal medicines? Are people taking them more and therefore having more disastrous results? Essentially, we don't know because we don't check for them. Um, if I get a case, the police will write down in great detail all of the pharmaceutical drugs. They won't write down the herbals because they think they're okay. Now, herbal preparations can cause all sorts of difficulties. I mean, garlic can increase bleeding tendencies. The American Society of Anesthesiology has recommended stopping herbal preparations two weeks before you have surgery. Uh, Carbo can increase the um, uh, respiratory depression effects of uh, anesthesia. And there are a whole range of different um, side effects. And then there's the issues of contamination and adulteration. So there's a, there are a whole lot of complex things that may occur with with herbs that we're not aware of. Some people, for example, um, will put pharmaceutical drugs into herbal preparations. When Viagra was invented, I thought, hooray, you know, rhinos will be safe because they were using rhino horns uh, as a stimulant. But what the herbalists are doing is getting Viagra and putting it into the rhino horn to demonstrate how effective their preparation was. There have been a number of cases in Hong Kong where people admitted to uh, ICU with uh, the effects of steroids because I'll be taking an anti-asthma herbal preparation that steroids have been added to, and you don't know how much is in there. And it may not be as sort of dangerous as drugs. I mean, fillers. Um, gluten is used as a filler sometimes in herbal preparations. So if you're gluten intolerant and you're taking a herbal preparation, that may be worsening the situation. St. John's wort is very commonly used. That can counteract the effects of um, uh, anti-cancer drugs. So if I have an elderly man who comes in and he's bled from a, uh, an ulcer in his stomach. I'll think, oh, he's bled from an ulcer in his stomach. Now, he may have arthritis and he's been warned off aspirin and everything, so he may be taking herbal anti-arthritic medications that may be loaded with aspirin. So in answer to your question, we don't know. And that's what we need to do. We need to investigate this because it may be a serious problem. It may not be. But ignorance is not a good place to be in. So how do you fix the problem? How do you start to account for these kinds of, the involvement of these preparations in, in, in cases? What we've been doing is we've been looking at, we've been doing laboratory work and we've been doing community work. And basically it's just to assess how bad the problem is to start with. We have found um, by just buying random herbal preparations that the ingredients don't match what's actually in them. Sometimes uh, herbalists will change one herb for another herb. And the reason for that may be that two herbs may have the same name, so it's a mistake, or the other herb is cheaper. And this happened in Belgium a number of years ago now. There was an outbreak of uh, kidney failure and people died because they'd transposed one herb for another herb. We um, very disturbingly found a few years ago uh, snow leopard in a preparation, and it was an anti-arthritic preparation, we picked up in Central Market in Adelaide. How does that happen? How does that get through customs? It wasn't on the label, but I got contacted by a, an NGO in the United Kingdom that had translated similar preparation that I, they'd got in China, and it had leopard bones. Um, the Chinese government passed a, a law saying that you can't use any leopard bones if the animal died after 2006. So there are a lot of snow leopards who apparently died before 2006. You know, I say to people, you can eat a snow leopard from its nose to its tail and your arthritis is not going to get any better. What about vitamins? I think, I mean, herbal preparations, as you say, it's very hard to monitor what's in them and work out whether a label is correct. What about just a standard vitamin preparation? Well, the problem is most people's diets are adequate, so you don't need the vitamins. Uh, they're quite expensive. Some people do, clearly. Um, that's at the better regulated end of the spectrum. The other end is basically when you go to the market and you just get a little pile of, um, of leaves. Um, and there was a case we had in Adelaide where a woman had gone to a herbalist. She had irritable bowel. And she took a preparation that contained 12 different herbs. And there's a problem with herb-herb interaction and herb-drug interaction. And it can be very variable and it can be different for you than it is for me. But anyway, she went into acute liver failure, had a transplant and then sadly died um, because of these drugs. And 
I think that the transplant organisations around the world are looking more and more closely at cases of acute liver failure. I remember being at the Women's and Children's Hospital years ago and having a couple of cases where children came in and they just had completely dead livers. And we looked for pesticides, we looked for drugs, we just couldn't work it out. And it just sort of stayed with me. And now I'm thinking, we never ask about herbs. Which herbs concern you the most? I think that um, there's a range of um, herbs that present problems. Um, but it's also the additions. For example, uh, heavy metal in some of the Indian and Tibetan and Nepalese preparations have caused uh, lead poisoning in children. Um, the pharmaceuticals, as I said, are, are an issue. Sometimes they have insecticides in them. Um, so it's the contamination, it's the processing. If you don't boil herbs containing aconite properly, the aconite will still be there, and that is a very toxic substance. You mentioned the local case of the one with IBS. What other kinds of cases do you see in Australia, in South Australia in particular? Well, I think if we look nationally, um, and, you know, and this this is clearly not a major problem for most herbal preparations. Um, we did a study looking at um, herbal preparations we obtained uh, on the internet and in the local market, and we found that 53% of them had undisclosed ingredients, whether they were fillers, whether they were drugs, uh, and that, that's, that's a real concern. What happens with the findings of that paper? Well, I think a lot of our material goes to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, who have legislation, but it's not, it's not really... Uh, legislation with teeth and there's one tier I understand that's just self-reporting the other thing is that the herbal preparations can sometimes um, change blood tests so your blood test result may not be accurate and again it's just uh, it's a complicated area that needs sorting out and uh, it was very disturbing we had a, uh, a cell culture that was liver cells and we put um, a herbal preparation in, did okay. We put Panadol in, did okay. Put the two together and the cells died. So Panadol and this herbal preparation together had a cumulative effect uh, that was very nasty. Now, I don't know how that translates to people in the community, but in the laboratory, it's, it's not good. We've had certain herbal soups that have done the same thing. So it's basically, you're taking stuff that you don't really understand and you don't really know what it is, what the concentration is, what effect it might have on you, and what might be the additives. Is it common for forensic pathologists to be doing this kind of work, to be investigating a herbal pre preparation beyond its presence in a body that's come onto your table? Yeah, I think N equals one, uh, Lisa. Um, I, I got interested with the case with the toad venom injection. And then I wrote a review of herbal problems, and I was astounded at how um, complex it was. I've actually presented this material in Hong Kong and in China, and, and I stood up um, in front of the audiences and said, how's this for an example of Western arrogance? Here am I telling you the dangers of Chinese herbal preparations. The pathologist there came up to me and said, my God, what are we going to do? We hadn't really thought about this. So I thought that was fascinating. It's, it's just this... Are we just looking at the tip of the iceberg? Is there a whole area that we don't understand? I once suggested we should have a, another discipline of um, forensic herbal toxicology. But I think for me, having become interested in the area, and I've got very good colleagues at the University of Adelaide, uh, Dr Ian Musgrave, who, who's got a laboratory. So I sort of plugged in there. And so I could bring the pathology forensic viewpoint, and they've got the laboratory work. And uh, we've been working very successfully. We've been doing um, studies with people in Western Australia. Um, we can do DNA analyses of the herbs to show what they are and what they might be. We're doing toxicology evaluations. We're looking at heavy metals. Um, so we're just sort of nibbling away at it. But we are a reasonably unique group. We'll be back right after this. So your work as a forensic pathologist is not just about working with the body that's presented to you, but 
feeding that information back to the other disciplines who might be able to use that to inform policy or change the way things work? Well, I'm in a pretty unique situation in that I'm you know, half at the university and half at forensic pathology. So I have the, the day-to-day work, but the academic side of it is much more complicated. Now, I've got an area that I've invented, I call preventive pathology, because all my clinical colleagues think that you know the pathologist knows everything, but you're always too late. Whereas we see cases they don't see. Our patient population is different. These are people that didn't actually get to hospital. So we've got information that really needs to go back to the community to, to prevent these deaths. I've done a lot of this in, in um, uh, the area of SIDS and, and, and child deaths. And I think anything that comes up that has the potential to be clarified and to help people, and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to actually get the community to be aware that this is not completely safe. It strikes me, obviously, at the moment, this conversation is particularly important. We're trying to vaccinate as much of the population as possible to get rid of COVID. And yet we seem to have an increasingly large population of people who don't believe in the vaccination, who think COVID is a conspiracy. And a lot of that seems to be a distrust around Western doctors, Western scientists, Western governments. How do you convince people who are already convinced that natural is best, that actually this thing that they've put so much of not just their beliefs, but even their identity around is potentially extraordinarily harmful, not just to them, but in terms of population health. I think that's a very good point. Um, And I think there is a mistrust of medicine. And, you know, many people have been killed by medical techniques and and, um, therapies. We know that. Um, It's just that we want to actually prevent that. How do you convince people? It's... I think it's very difficult. Um, Part of the problem with herbals is that people don't want to tell their doctor about it because they they fear they're going to be ridiculed. Um, They want to use herbs because that gives them control over their their health, um, which is, you know, completely understandable, laudable. I'm not against herbal preparations at all. I just just want people to be able to feel safe uh, about having them. I guess a segue from that is what what do you think about vaccinations? Essential. Um, I think clearly anti-vaxxers have never seen a child die of measles or mumps. I have in New Guinea when I worked up there as a student. Vaccinations got rid of smallpox. Um, To suggest a virus is a conspiracy is verging on insanity, I think. You know, we, we really need to protect ourselves and vaccination is the best way to go. And I'm assuming that you've been practicing pathology for long enough to have seen the eradication of some diseases that might have come across your table 40 years ago that we don't see anymore because of vaccinations. That, that's correct. I mean, diseases have disappeared, but they are coming back, like tuberculosis, you know, syphilis is making a comeback. So um, malaria is. It's the revenge of nature. You know, it's just the way things go. So Anything we can do to stop that, I think, is that's not harmful. Now, the side, everything has side effects. Clearly, vaccines have side effects. Um, and herbal well, preparations have side effects. Yeah. How many people have been killed on South Australian roads in the last month? So should we get rid of cars? Too much of anything has the potential to be toxic. We know that you drink too much water, you're going to die because you're going to flood your body. Things like vitamins, which I think some people think, I'll get a cold, I'm going to take 10 vitamin C a day and I'll get over my cold more quickly. Is there any truth in that? No, there's not. And, uh, you know, if one is good, 10 is not necessarily better. Is and there potential for harm as well in, in taking too vi- much? Vitamins can cause um, yeah, significant health issues if, if you take, uh, take too many. It's a question of how do we regulate the herbal industry uh, and the uh, supplement industry. I, I think what needs to be done is more scientific testing needs to be done of these products. And if the manufacturers are making you know, a lot of money out of it, well, they can pay for it. That's what drug companies do. Um, so there should be a way of having these preparations tested, being published in reputable journals, peer-reviewed, not predatory journals. And that's Another issue that we come across nowadays is, uh, I don't know whether you're aware of predatory journals. Tell us about predatory journals. Essentially, you and I could set up our own journal. We set up a web page, 
and we charge people 2,000 US uh, to get published. There's the publish or perish mentality. And so people will pay for this. We say they're peer reviewed, they're not. So you can basically buy publications. And these journals look very like legitimate journals. And I know of cases where they have produced papers from these journals in court, say, well, this disagrees completely with what you say. So a lot of herbal material and results have been published in, in these journals. So it's very difficult to sort it out. But I think that um, we need to have a, a stronger uh, government control of this with penalties. Are some people more likely to suffer harm from taking these kinds of things? There is a lot of individual variability. And you will get 10 people who can take a uh, particular substance, they'll be fine. The 11th won't because they've got just a different metabolic uh, system. Elderly people who are on an array of different pharmaceutical drugs are really at risk of herb drug interactions. Infants also are at risk because their liver is not mature, so they, their metabolic pathways haven't matured, so they're more susceptible to bad effects of a particular substance, whether it's herb or drug. And one of the terrible things is people being giving this stuff to their dogs. And we saw recently there were a lot of dogs dying in Victoria because they'd eaten meat that was apparently contaminated by the cows that had been eating a, uh, it's a native Australian species. Incredibly angry. The contamination has killed 21 dogs in Victoria, but that figure could rise. As many as 30 Melbourne shops may have inadvertently sold the toxic meat after sourcing it through pet food supplier EcoPet. But if you look into the literature, people who think herbal preparations are great, give them to their animals, so what dose do you use? And there have been dogs brought into vets who have been poisoned and it's been from herbs. Now, a vet probably wouldn't normally think of that. They'd think of all the other standard poisons. And if you don't think of herbal preparations, the animal survives and may be given the herbs again, or other animals may be given it. So again, that's just another area where there's not enough knowledge of the possible problems. So if you had one message for people who really see these kinds of things as an important part of their life. I mean, it appears to me that there's room for the more regulated ones in a complementary sense. What's your advice? My advice is just to buy from reputable sources, not necessarily um, small businesses in, in marketplaces, um, but be aware that the ingredients list may not be accurate and it may not include everything, talk to your doctor and talk to your naturopath. Yeah, get a conversation going so that we're not in silos, so that we can both help each other. What is our aim? Our aim is for us all to have the best possible health. And so we just need to you know, realize that it's not a fight. You know, we're in this together. Guardians of the Dead is brought to you by The Advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide. The show is produced by myself, Greg Barilla. Elisa Black is your host. Mixing and sound design by Emily Dore. Make sure you're following Guardians of the Dead on your favourite podcast app. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave us a review. In our final episodes, we'll explore some of the most unusual cases Roger has seen and describes how a piece of clothing or a fish hook may be potentially lethal. I'm Greg Barilla. Thanks for listening.